What I consider interesting when it comes to dynamic chess is that I first became familiar with the practical applications of the concept resulting from my style as a player, rather than its definition. I had of course heard about it as vague references to dynamic chess were made in certain books and games, but I didn't know and I didn't realize the, the value of this concept until I started noticing it in my games. I wish it was the other way around and I had uh, read many books on the subject, but uh, the shocking reality is that very few books exist on dynamic chess, as opposed to positional or strategic chess, for example. So how do I define dynamic chess or playing dynamic chess? That is the definition you can see on screen. Uh, so basically that is to create, enforce, maintain or exploit positions in which uh, one or several centers of attention exist which are defined by a fluidity and interaction of the pieces that can lead to drastic changes in the nature of the position that is in favor of the side enforcing the change, but can often lead to further possibilities for both sides. So these changes in position and the advantages they lead to are known as the dynamic aspects of chess, such as initiative, space, time, coordination and activity, which are the ones I mentioned in the introduction. Um, I do not think it's necessary to define each and every one, as I am going to show how they are applied in practice uh, and what their significance actually is. However, it must be said that playing dynamic chess can result in any kind of advantage, including winning material and even checkmate, and that is achieved by the better handling and understanding of the aforementioned fluidity and multitude of interactions between the pieces that are typical of dynamic chess positions. So why do I refer to dynamic chess as the, the metagame of chess and uh, what is so valuable or special about it? When you aim to and play dynamic chess successfully, you have access to a reality that is invisible to your opponent who is not as well versed in dynamic chess as you. And being able to access that reality allows you to shape the game in ways that lead to quick and sudden victories. It is as if you play a game, the rules of which are completely unknown to your opponent. Um, you may have also noticed from the introduction or the definition of uh, dynamic chess that um, the ensuing changes can lead to further possibilities for both sides. So in that case, isn't there something suspect about the validity and the benefits of this concept? If after all, it does not lead to forced wins. The idea behind dynamic chess is not to necessarily lead to a forced win, but to lead to a position that you have assessed as advantageous for you and which your opponent is uncomfortable with and has um, not even taken into consideration yet. What this means is that the computer might not always approve of your choices, but you will be posing practical problems to your opponent that you will often be unable to solve. So. It is here that we actually need to address psychology as the link and the tool to achieve this goal. But before we do that, we need to go back to the definition of dynamic chess and the concepts of centers of attention. In, um, in order to create these centers of attention, one can use the tools I mentioned in the introduction, and namely deception, provocation, entering complications inflicting miscoordination on your opponent's pieces and pressure. Um, what these centers of attention then become is simply things your opponent constantly needs to watch out for until he becomes so overburdened with having to consider the variety of factors and variations at play that he simply collapses even though objectively a solution to his problems um, may exist. That is the psychological domination that goes hand in hand with dynamic chess and is often needed in order for dynamic chess to be successful or comes as a result of playing dynamic chess. One more thing that um, needs to be said, however, is that dynamic chess is probably not for everyone. And uh, <clears throat> depending on where you are in your development as a chess player, it might not suit your style. And um, if you do not like entering complications or struggle with calculation, perhaps, perhaps dynamic chess is best left for a later part of your career. Although objectively, every strong player should be comfortable with both due to the fact that we do not always choose the nature of the position that is about to occur. And dynamic play is often imposed on us when we least want it. 
Now I would like to show how Dynamic Chess is played and what its true power actually means by looking at a few games of mine. And I am sure better examples exist, but because I know these games well, I can also shed some light on the psychological factors leading to or resulting from the Dynamic Chess as played in these games. I understand that what has been said so far might seem overly complex or somewhat unnecessary, but I would kindly ask you to stay with me until the end of the video and it will all make sense at the end of it, I hope. We are going to look at four games. In the first game, we are going to see how the opponent collapses under the weight of multiple centers of attention or attention centers. In the second game, we'll see um, a violent and drastic change in the nature of the position, which my opponent could not foresee in any way. In the third game, we're going to look at a slightly more mundane concept, such as the concept of castling on the opposite sides and the concept of time. In the fourth game, which I think is very interesting, we're going to see how both of us were playing with uh, some dynamic concept in mind and were hoping to have our plan carried out first. In the first game, I'm playing the Blumenthal Gambit, which is a gambit I fully recommend. And I recommend this gambit mainly because, unlike other gambits, like for example the King's Gambit, where you end up on the back foot in many variations where you don't know the theory, and it kind of feels like a gambit is being played against you. The Blumenfeld Gambit, however, has some very distinct ideas which are very easy to implement over the board and are very easy to remember which I'm going to show in this game. So this is the standard move order. Now this might potentially lead to repetition, which obviously white should not accept. And if you're playing as black, you do not need to enforce such repetition if you're playing against a much weaker opponent, so that's all fine. Now after this move, even though this is not a typical Blumenfeld Gambit accepted position, Recapturing with the bishop leads to such a position. Now here we can talk about the basic ideas in the Blumenfeld Gambit, which are bishop to b7, simply placing your pieces on natural squares, which are bishop to b7, bishop to d6, knight to c6, or knight to d7, castling short side, from where you actually have two plans. One is to Create a pass pawn resulting from this fluid center which is able to move forward. Or go for a kingside attack which I decide to do in this game. Now even though you're going for a kingside attack, this does not invalidate the option of creating a pass pawn and you still have that opportunity. So here I'm just increasing the dynamic advantage of space and misplacing one of the spaces. And this might seem like a weakening move, but it's actually not. Because you can see that his bishops have absolutely no way of getting to the king's side, even though it might potentially seem that this is going to happen sooner or later. And his king is also his queen is also cut off from any attacking opportunities on the king's side. So I am simply trying to place my pieces on the best squares for an attack against the king, which was the initial concept I had in mind when I pushed e4. He defends the h2 pawn, which is fine. I attack it with another piece. And now it is here that we can actually talk about the concept of centers of attention or attention centers. We can clearly see four centers of attention here, and that is the loose knight on h3, the open f file and the weak f2 square, the fluid center, which can potentially create a pass pawn and create further complications, and the loose bishop on b5. Now, every strong player here would be concerned about these two, lo two loose pieces first, and they will try to either defend them or place them on better squares. It might not seem like a big deal, they cannot be attacked immediately, but this is very scary actually if, um, if, you, if you know what you're doing. You would, that would be the first thing to think for how to actually coordinate these pieces and um, bring them back into the game. He does not really have the opportunity here simply because um, my, my pieces are so well placed that um, you will see how 
how that better placement is exploited during the game. Here I simply decide to go for creating a pass pawn. And this pawn, the problem with this pawn is that it cannot be captured simply because that that wins a piece. So that means that this bishop needs to move and the only sensible square for it is the b2 square. Now I play it safe by creating the pass pawn. And he needs to find a good square for the queen. And this is a good square for the queen because it creates a battery in this dark square diagonal. Which is very far from actually becoming a real, real threat, unfortunately, for white. And now I begin to exploit this um, weak position of, of his pieces and somewhat loose position of his pieces. That is the only defensive move. And you might ask what the purpose of this move is. I mean, this is such an obvious threat that it almost looks like a waste of time. This move is played for psychological reasons, and that is to draw his attention to this particular center of attention, because whatever minor calculation he needs to perform here distracts him from, from the other centers of attention and uh, kind of drains his resources when it comes to calculating consistently well during the remainder of the game. He, for example, has two squares here. One is bishop to a4, which doesn't make any sense. And that is the other square. But then he needs to think, am I going to take this bishop or am I going to move the king? And if I take, would it take with the queen or would it take with the knight? And again, this is a very simple calculation to perform. But as I said, it simply drains your resources. And uh, it kind of increases the doubt in the player's mind as to exactly what is about to follow on the board. So I simply do not recapture this bishop. That is an obvious, obvious choice because I need this knight to remain on this very good square where it can attack a lot of pieces and a lot of squares. He decides to regroup the knight, which is fine. This knight is doing absolutely nothing here, so he kind of overprotects the, the f3 square. Now I am switching the attention to another center of attention, that is the f-file in the weak f2 square. And it's precisely here that he collapses. And it was never out of the question um, during the previous few moves that he would make a mistake. That, that is actually quite natural in positions like this where your attention is stretched between so many potential weaknesses and so many centers of attention. They do not even have to be weaknesses. They simply need to be things he constantly needs to watch out for, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction to this video. So he simply collapses with knight takes e4. And what is, what is the worst thing about this move is that after bishop to b7, my initiative here almost becomes unstoppable. He probably thought that that was a free pawn. But unfortunately, it's not. That is because of the following move. That is rook takes f2 after bishop takes d3. It is also unfortunate for him that he does not have other moves apart from bishop f3, a uh, bishop d3, and we'll see that from the from the next following moves. So after this move, he simply thinks he defends the knight, and after the knight moves away, he can give a check or something. So I do not even. I do not even think he suspects how bad things are here. And then comes this, this move, which threatens checkmate on the next move. Uh, king to h1 leads to checkmate on h2, and uh, king to h3 leads to exactly the same checkmate on h2. So this is already this is already resignable, of course. And now, if he does not take the pawn on d3, his only other move is f3, after which... Uh, the plan is exactly the same. Bishop takes e4, and now he cannot recapture neither the knight nor the bishop. If he captures the bishop, obviously we have rook to f2 with exactly the same checkmate. And if he, he cannot capture the knight, <clears throat> because um, his king is pinned against the bishop. Other desperate ideas, for example, like... Uh, this simply does not work because he's down a piece. <clears throat> and let's see what um, what the best way to continue here is because he's threatening two pieces and now his king is out of any any immediate danger. But now there's this move, which is not that easy to see. However, after bishop to f3, I have a. Uh, I have two knights for the rook, and this is um, 
this is almost completely hopeless because of bishop to d3 I simply move the king away and now let's say he plays he plays something like let's let's choose a random move here uh, I actually have a checkmate by playing this move so let's say that he tries to prevent this move somehow by playing rook to f1 then we have knight f2 rook f2 queen d7 and that simply leads to checkmate he can cover with the bishop and he can cover with the pawn but that also leads to checkmate so that was a slightly more complex variation but again it's uh it's it's quite obvious that white is completely lost here So essentially, after after bishop to e4, this is already resignable. There are even moves like knight to f3, and let's actually see what happens after that. Because that seems like a more natural move than knight to f3. And we're simply up a knight here. If you prefer playing this way, you're simply up a knight here and obviously his king has a has an absolutely terrible position so this is the kind of outcome and this is the kind of position you can expect to obtain from a Blumenfeld gambit opening and especially one in which you manage to accentuate on on having multiple centers of attention across the board that is simply how the game is likely to end, with a complete collapse. Moving on to the next game. That is a tournament game, and I'm playing black here. I'm not going to go in over the opening moves in great detail. Suffice it to say that I misplayed the opening by playing some very naive moves, like this one, for example. Queen to a5. I was kind of hoping for bishop to c2, after which bishop to a6 is very good for black. Obviously, he does not need to do this. He can simply play queen to c2, and then I'm, I'm already worse here. And that move does not really help the situation. That makes it even worse. So after this, I have a dubious pawn structure, and I'm unable to complete development. Or I'm behind the development, let's say. And this is definitely worse for black. This simply cannot be good for black. But after this multi-purpose move, I managed to get back into the game. Because if he doesn't play f4 here, or e5, and he allows this knight to come back to e5, that is a very good multi-purpose move. As well, because from here, this knight can uh, threaten the bishop on d3, can threaten the f3 square, and also protects the bishop on d7. So he decides not to go for complications, which from a psychological point of view is maybe the right choice because I already have a worse position. So why overpress here when he can maybe hope for some long-term advantage? So I proceed with, uh, with this move. And now I do not like knight to d7. It is the burden on him is here to try and find some sort of a dynamic option and try to harass me somehow and exploit the awkward position of my pieces and my lack of development. This exchange, even though the computer approves it, simply simplifies the position way too much and I am able to consolidate here by playing a5 which stops b4 and the plan here for me is to play c5 on which square this pawn protects this pawn and is also protected by a dark square bishop. And on this square, this pawn is almost impossible to attack. Proceeding with the plan, as mentioned, and now I simply complete development. And even though you might think that in this position, he has some superior activity of his pieces, I also have an advantage, which is a passed pawn. So it is very hard to give the edge to anyone in particular here. Now I play rook to a7, because this rook is always... Uh, 
under attack by this queen so that means that this rook cannot really move from this rank either and is always tied to the defense of this rook so that is a good move I did not like h6 here this is um, this is not a good move it's simply not the right time to play this move and it's too soon to play this move because there are no viable threats on the back rank so while this is a possible move this is the wrong time to play it so I did not like it because it kind of enables his pawn storm as well but anyway the computer does not disapprove of this move and now what is the dynamic change in the nature of the position that I am trying to enforce here It is playing c4. Let's say he chooses to play a random move here or not proceed with this move. Because after c4, he kind of has to take this pawn, otherwise, the rest of the options are simply not good. And if he captures with the pawn, I capture the rook, so that's out of the question. If he captures with the rook, I play another dynamic move, and that is a4. And then if he captures with the rook, I capture with the rook on a4, pawn takes a4, queen a4. And the whole purpose behind this is to enable the pass pawn to move forward by supporting it with other pieces from the side, with other major pieces, or whatever pieces I have remaining in the position. That, however, is not possible in this position, and uh, the pawn is kind of stuck while he still has some sort of a pawn stop on the king's side, which my pieces are currently away from. So, he of course does not play h3 and he plays the next move, which is f5. And now, the move I play next, I did not think that c4 was a good move now, simply because uh, his, uh, his pawn storm is kind of getting there first. That is what I thought. The computer gives this as equal. However, I actually really want to try and uh, simply implement this dynamic change in the nature of the position I just spoke about. And that can be done by following move. Now, he does not have to take this queen, but I was almost certain that he would. And it is here that we can mention the psychological factors in the position. They are as follows. This is a much stronger opponent than me. He was much higher rated. I'm not saying he was much stronger. He was much higher rated than me. And um, he has been eyeing this pawn for quite a while. At the same time, he thinks that this is some sort of a capitulation on my part because I cannot stop the pawn storm. Therefore, the best thing I can do is exchange queens, reduce his attacking potential, after which he will still be able to take this pawn. He's, so he's simply up a pawn here. I thought that that's how he was going to think about this position, and that is exactly what happened. However, <laughs> that is precisely the way I did not see this position. I saw the position a completely different way, and that is because of the following dynamic concept. And uh, that is increasing the activity of my pieces. He has to take this pawn because c3 is simply winning for black. He cannot allow this to connect it past pawns. So he takes, but then after this move, uh, the problem with his position is that there's no good way to defend his bishop because of a fork on b4. And uh, the whole purpose behind this queen exchange was actually this fork because I calculated up to here. Judging by his reaction and how surprised he was, he clearly had not seen any of this. So he actually lifted the rook. He wanted to play it on d1, but that is simply not a good move because of bishop to g5. And um, that is uh, simply very good for, for black. Now, whatever he plays here, he's, uh, he's simply losing material. So he tries to go for this, just connect his pawns, maybe rely on the pass pawn somehow. But now I do not even have to take with the rook because I can take with the bishop and this is completely winning for black, obviously. I have a discovery on the king, I can take this pawn, I have a pass pawn at the same time. And on top of that, the king is uh, quick enough to stop this pawn. So that is perfectly fine for black, even completely winning, I would say. However, he does not play this move because he simply saw that this is bad. And we can also talk about this move. But that is not that good for black, even though it's still, it's still potentially winning. Because this allows him to kind of improve his rook first.
and uh, then I have to take with the rook. That is the problem. I do not have the. Well, that is kind of the same thing, really. It was after he takes. The only difference is that he has stepped away from the A file and he can actually push the A pawn now, which is not a big deal. I would consider this completely winning as black still. And it is for that reason he plays rook to f2 here, which is the much better move. Now, after this move with the forking idea, he has the same plan. And now there's one problem here, and that is the move rook to b2. After which my rook has to move, but cannot defend this bishop because of this pawn on c4. So we kind of arrive at this end game, which is better for white, let's be honest. But there's a lot of work to be done for white here, because my rook will be able to get behind these pass pawns, and at the same time I have a pass pawn. So this is not that straightforward for white. Now, why you might ask then this whole sequence is good for black? Because when I initiated the sequence, I took the psychological factors of this position into account. And that is the fact that we had both had very little time on the clock. We had about five minutes, between five and ten minutes each, if I remember correctly. So I simply thought that this fork was going to be good enough to completely throw him off. And that is exactly what happened, because, in fact, in the actual game, neither of us considered this move. And that is completely understandable, because from a human perspective, if you really think about it, most people would not really be thinking like, oh, let's actually find a winning plan here, must have a win. They would probably be thinking, I just got played, now I have to simply deal with this draw we're getting into where he has a bishop and I have two pawns for the bishop. So that is precisely what happens and he takes the rook on e5. Now this endgame I consider winning for black and that is because that is because of this. After this move king to f8 is uh, not good or not, not as good as another move which I'm going to show you. But I actually played for a draw here deliberately because the match situation, this was a team match, wasn't that great and my team was actually losing badly. So I did not want to lose my game as well. And I basically saw that after king to f8, there is simply no way to lose this. And this is an easy draw at least. However, there's a better move here. And that is the winning move and that is d3. Now, if he captures, I have bishop to e5. And this is... Uh, this I can see the winning, and I think the engine wins this uh, all the time. I've tried a few times, and the engine actually wins this. Because the king and the bishop are going to put white's king into some sort of a zugzwang, where he will have to move away from this pawn, and after this pawn falls, that's the end of the game. At the same time, he does not have enough time to advance this pawn, and if he advances this pawn sufficiently, the bishop will be placed here, but the king will be also attacking this pawn. So what that means is that if he somehow manages to enforce a2 while having this pawn protected by the king, I can simply sacrifice the bishop for the pawn, then collect this pawn and proceed to collect the remaining pawns. So that is how this endgame is won. And uh, that would be great if that was the only move he has, but I did not play d3 because I saw that he has another move here. And in this variation, even though this is also winning for black, this gives him an opportunity to queen while we both queen. I queen, uh, he queens first, or I believe I queen first. But then I thought that he can also queen with this pawn as well. And that is what kind of scared me in this position. And that's why I did not go for this. But as we'll see, this is completely winning for black as well. Now, king to f8 here is absolutely not good because it is then that he captures this pawn. And um, I would even say that he... He actually definitely has some sort of advantage, even though not big. It is, it's absolutely not worth going for this variation for any reason. So I simply need to allow him to queen, which is absolutely fine, because I queen as well. And now I, for some reason, thought that he was going to take this pawn after the check, and after moving my king to this only escape square. But now this leads to checkmate. 
funny enough which is this and if he doesn't go for this which he shouldn't obviously after his other move which the computer recommends is this my advantage here is uh, 2.35 which is winning and that is because I can give checks while taking some pawns after which I can simply exchange queens and uh, I'm obviously left with a bishop but with a significant advantage and this will be even more advantageous than the basic uh, bishop against two pawns endgame after he captured on e on d3 so that is winning as well now if you can if you compare this endgame to the endgame he had after the move rook to b2 you can totally see why playing in this manner was worth it because this endgame is much easier to win for me than the other endgame was to win for him so that is what I wanted to show about this game a very nice idea dynamic chess idea clearing the pawns and activating your pieces while having a tactical sequence at the same time which puts him on the back foot completely now let's have a look at the next game and in that game I am playing white and this is a Karokan defense now theory here I believe I believe the most common move here is knight captures to f6 but I might be wrong knight captures to f6 leads to the last and variation of the Karokan if he recaptures with g with the g pawn and to a very boring and incredibly dull variation if he captures with the e pawn and that is a variation I don't like playing uh, I've never liked playing this variation and I never will which is precisely the reason I play this move because this allows me to play dynamic chess even though this might be slightly unsound theoretically or maybe not necessarily advantageous for white I much prefer this move and I will always play this move regardless of the format I'm playing whether it's rapid, blitz, bullet or classical chess this is the move I'm going to play Perhaps that makes you a bit predictable when it comes to opening preparation and might, might switch things up a bit. But um, especially in blitz and rapid games, I would always play this move. So let's see how the game developed. Now it is already here that black needs to think about dynamic chess. And why is that? That is because he must he must take into account the fact that I can still castle both ways, both king side and queen side. After which comes the natural question, what happens if we both initiate our pawn storm? So he probably thinks, I'm going to castle king side, he's going to castle queen side, but because he's castling later than me, my pawn storm is somehow going to be more successful. Or worst case scenario, we don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> that's, that's probably not the way you should be thinking in this position, and that is because of this move which arised in the early opening this move or this pawn rather is a hook onto which I can hang on my pieces or my pawn storm so therefore I believe my pawn storm is, is more likely to, to be successful here even though the computer does not disapprove of castling short side and I think that that might depend on your engine uh, some engines might actually give this move as a second move and not necessarily first move. I think from a human perspective it's rather obvious that uh, white has a, a dynamic advantage here and that is time. Or namely the fact that it takes less time for white's plan to come into fruition. So let's see what happens in the game. He castles. I clearly see the idea already that I should be I should be simply better or quicker with my pawn storm here. Because, because of the simple fact he attacks with two pawns if he starts his pawn storm, and there are no pieces to attack and no pieces to engage on these squares, and even if they get here, they will easily move away, thus extending the amount of time it takes for his pawn storm to make any impact on the queen side. The other problem is that he needs an additional tempo by moving the, king, the queen to start his pawn storm. 
He can of course start the pawn stone first before moving the queen, but this queen needs to go somewhere, somewhere anyway. So that I consider another loss of tempo. And as you can see, already on the second move after castling, I can engage the king's side and I can create some, some friction and some tension between the pieces there. Which is one of the prerequisites for, for playing dynamic chess. And this is how dynamic chess starts. Okay, we exchange some pieces here. That's absolutely fine. And now comes g5. And the only move here is h5, which he assesses correctly. But now I'm trying to break up the pawn chain. And at the same time, he has this weak pawn on h5. And I'm somehow threatening even checkmates on h7. So this is already unpleasant for white. And this is already better for white. Even the computer gives it as better. While just a few moves ago, it was giving it as completely equal. Let's look at something else as well. And that is that here, you might ask, where does black go wrong? And um, there's a very computer-like move here, which is f6, which very few people would actually play. In a, in a real game, and again, white still has a slight advantage here. So once again, you need to be thinking about the human factors in the position, how comfortable a position is from a, from a human perspective. Now, after this move, he actually has three options here, and the best option is c4. In the game, he actually played the worst option, which is uh, g takes uh, f takes g6. There's another option of playing simply playing f6. So let's start with the strongest move here, which is uh, c4. Now, as I mentioned, when it comes to black spawn storm, white can simply move the pieces away that are in its way, and uh, black will simply need to keep pushing these pawns while being under attack and while not having fully developed his rooks. So once again, you can clearly see how this pawn storm is less likely to be successful than this one. Now, he also has two options here to either recapture or play f6, but uh, playing f6 is, is simply not good. Um, no, sorry, this is not the right move. After d5, he needs to take, because I become way too active here, and now, as we can see, we have two centers of attention. He needs to think about the attack on his king's side, and what is actually happening in the center. He also needs to think about the, the third center of attention, and that is how exactly to proceed with this pawn storm, because this is his only active possibility. So this simply cannot be good for black. This is already visually, visually highly unpleasant for black, and uh, no sane person is deliberately going to go into this position. <clears throat> However, that was, um, as I said, c4 is still, c4 is still the best option here because it leads to a somewhat smaller advantage for white compared to the other variations. Now let's look at f6. And after f6, I can engage in these exchanges here, the purpose of which will become very clear. Now, let's say... Knight to d4, or knight captures here. Let's see what happens after knight d4. First of all, I want to see what happens, what happens after this move. Hmm. Yeah, knight c5 is very direct. And 
And yeah, it gives a big advantage for white here. And that is a very nice, very nice sacrifice. Because if it does this, this is going to lead to yeah, this is going to lead to checkmate here. And let's see, he plays this. Queen g7. And that is a checkmate because of this rook. But let's say that this uh, knight sacrifice is somewhat, somewhat invisible. What happens after knight to g4? Yeah, knight to d4 is not that good. But again, objectively, this is way better for white, regardless of what black plays here. So if he plays queen to c5, then that is simply not beca good because of knight d4, and now this pawn is under attack. The only sensible way to defend this pawn is with um, rook to e8, and let's see what happens after this move. Yeah, knight c6, this actually leads to checkmate, because... He cannot really defend his bishop if he tries to defend it this way. Then we have rook to d6. And then a checkmate follows because if he takes this rook, <laughs> the only problem now is that this knight actually uh, attacks the only escape square for the, for, the, for the king. And you can either start with queen h5 or even this knight sacrifice which he needs to take, otherwise the next move leads to checkmate. And now this also leads to checkmate. Funny enough, this is a checkmate. And white does not even have to play this move because let's say that not everyone can see this move. After the capture, this leads to exactly the same. Because let's say he moves the rook anywhere. And this. And then this and that leads to checkmate again. So that is not good. Now let's see what happened after the move he played in the game, which I consider to be the worst, simply because this is a this is a disaster in the making. I already have the open G file while well, ready to double the rooks on the G file, so <laughs> I wouldn't say that this is resignable already, but this is extremely unpleasant to play for black. And now I simply ignore this and I capture the h pawn, which is the good move. The problem here though is that exchanging pieces does not help black in any way because of white's initiative. On the king side, which is simply not affected by exchanging pieces in the center. Now here, the best move is knight g6, queen g6. Queen c4 and then rook to g5. And then simply nothing follows after this move. If he tries to exchange queens, I simply could play queen to e4. And now the question is not whether this is winning for white, but how difficult of a technical task is it? Because it's obviously winning for white. I'm up a pawn, his king is exposed, my major pieces are more active. So it's only a matter of time here. This, his pawn structure is also very, very bad, and this pawn is going to fall sooner or later as well, after which I have two pass pawns. So that's not good. He played uh, queen to c3 instead, which is a bit of a blunder, because after this check, I am simply up the exchange here, and after he, he insists on this queen exchange, and after this, this is just winning. 
So as we saw from this game, dynamic chess does not have to be overly complex. You can simply exploit simple concepts like the concept of opposite side castling and uh, the concept of time. You do not have to go for an extremely complex variation where you hope to outcalculate your opponent all the time, which is the basic prerequisite for, for playing dynamic chess. And it's absolutely fine if you want to do that. But again, you have simpler ideas and simpler concepts within dynamic chess. Now let's move on to the next game. And that is a game also played in a tournament. I'm playing black here and that is a game from the times I played the French defense. The interesting thing about this game is that we both play with some dynamic concept in mind and we both hope that we are gonna we're gonna get there first so to speak so after the opening moves we have this somewhat rare for a french defense position and a very interesting position at the same time because you have to remember this is a tournament game and this looks kind of scary for black and is very stressful i would actually say for both sides because if your plan fails, you're simply facing a disaster on, on the side you have just castled. And I would like to emphasize that this definitely looks scarier for black, simply because white will open the b-file sooner or later. And if I try to play this move, then I am just probably weakening the, the king side even further. And this is definitely an advantage for white here. So I will have to allow the opening of the B file. And now, once again, if you if you look at the game from white's perspective, he seems much safer here because this pawn seems like it's stopping everything that's happening on the king side. But while this pawn may seem like a strength, it will actually turn out to be a weakness. And you will see why very shortly. He proceeds with his plan. And now comes this move. It turns out that whatever he plays here is actually, is actually wrong or somewhat uncomfortable to play from a human perspective if you take the following moves into account. So if he takes, now the g-file is open and it's only a matter of time before this pawn falls. And at the same time, he has this somewhat indefensible pawn, which I believe he saw all of this. And he's um, just going forward as if nothing is happening. He decides to abandon this pawn. And I'm pretty sure he saw all of this. This was a decent opponent. This was a 19 plus 100 rated opponent. And uh, this, is how we, this is how we end up after the, after the opening moves. Now, the one thing you could say already, though, is that my attack is uh, not, not completely, not looking so harmless anymore. He probably, however, still thinks that he has enough pieces to defend. And let's not forget that his queen is on the second rank, from which it can provide some defenses against the king, should I engage in sacrifices and hope to deliver a checkmate on the second rank. He can also maybe play rook to a2 further increasing his defenses so once again from a human perspective it's it's very hard to say whether someone is clearly better here now i'll tell you that from a computer point of view this is very good for black and the computer gives a big advantage for black but from a human perspective in a tournament game it's not very easy to to make that assessment now he's opened the B file and this is already looking looking scary because if I manage to play C6 trying to defend the B file, he can exert further pressure with playing bishop to B5. Now, however, we need to think about what's happening on the king side first. I am threatening this pawn and there's no good way to defend it. And the problem in, in this particular position is that he actually tries to save the the h pawn 
while he should simply focus on his dynamic advantage and that's uh, his initiative on on the queen side and the funny thing is that here we both think we have the initiative and it's very it's very hard to to say when you look at the position from first side who actually has it i still think this looks kind of scarier for for black than it does for white but objectively that is not the that is not the assessment at all so here white should either play rook to b1 or bishop to f3 but he tries to defend the h pawn which is totally understandable if i take this h pawn then uh, things are not looking so so great for white and things that after this move everything's fine i do not have anything immediate on the king's side and uh, he can simply carry out his his attacking plan on the queen side however a better move here is this move and now if i play this You might think that uh, this is already looking very ugly for black and I'm not going to tell you what the next move is but um, it is an absolute shocker in this position which white actually experienced firsthand in the game because I had the opportunity to play this move in the main line which I want to show first suffice it to say that black actually has a checkmate in six moves from this position believe it or not now let's go back to the main line and uh, it's it's fair to say that from a computer point of view black has a huge advantage here now let's see what happens if he does not play this move if, if he let's say tries to defend the pawn in this move in by this by playing this move that simply leads to checkmate because after all these exchanges that is a checkmate and if he chooses any other moves after I captured this pawn with the bishop, then that simply ends to another kind of game ender. Whether that's a checkmate or winning a lot of material is another matter. And now we go to the main line. And that is the move. <laughs> and that is a move you would probably play in an instant in a blitz game. But in a classical game, it's not so easy because you have to calculate. And let's say this backfires somehow and you're not able to regain the material or checkmate your opponent, you're simply down a rook in this position. However, I calculated quite deeply here, and I saw that white is much worse in all possible lines here. And now here, he's already on the back foot with, a, with I would say, a completely losing position, because now his advantage, or I wouldn't say advantage, his plan will will never be able to to be carried out simply because i will always have the bishop to c6 move and this is way more defensible than it used to be simply because this bishop cannot exert any pressure on the queen side and he will never achieve anything meaningful on the queen side now the next move is this move and that is playing in the spirit of dynamic chess you might think that i might want to play h5 here just to secure being down in exchange but uh, the position requires an active play bringing further pieces into the attack now he tries to create threats of his own while leaving some space for the king and at the same time moving away from the spin now i will suggest you pause the video and try and find the next move for black it is very interesting move because it's in complete contrast with all the moves played previously which were sacrifices activating pieces and so on the move actually here is d3 which is exactly what i played in the game it is after this move judging by his facial expression he understood that things were not going well because in this position you think okay probably not bad i'm up a rook if i manage to escape with the king which should be kind of okay if let's say i'm able to to somehow create an escape square or space on the king side for the on the queen side for the king to escape maybe i'm fine that's what you would you would be thinking as white but after this move you suddenly realize there's no escape square for the king and my attack is simply very quick and very strong here 
he probably tries to counter sacrifice here on b3 somehow and maybe just create the so much needed escape square for the king but there's simply no time for this after this move and now comes another sacrifice and that is a sacrifice that unfortunately for white cannot be ignored because i am threatening checkmate on g1 so he simply needs to needs to either capture this rook his other only other move is this but then after queen to h3 this leads to checkmate the purpose behind this sacrifice is not just the threat on g1 because the main purpose behind this move is to free the f3 square for the queen and now after this move he simply resigned because two kinds of checkmates follow whatever he plays he has only two moves here one is queen f2 after which I have a checkmate on g3 or bishop to bishop to f2 after which I have a similar idea king to g1 queen to h1 checkmate so that is pretty much what i wanted to say about dynamic chess and uh, i hope i have given you some idea of what dynamic chess is and um, what its true power actually is this is how this is how i play this is what my style is and uh, this is what my style is regardless of whether i'm playing blitz or classical chess and uh, that is simply because i think that is how chess should be played uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.